And your wife must sense that call. I've seen too many men call, but their wife didn't sense that call. And you ought to work together as a team, so wives need to hear God's voice as well. And then thirdly, the man God uses will lead a holy and disciplined life. It takes a lot of discipline to be an evangelist. I want to tell you. I've had to turn down hundreds of hours of wonderful fellowship in order to get back to my room to get enough rest, to get enough strength for the next sermon. Or to study and prepare and to write articles or to write this or to handle this or to handle the other. It takes extreme discipline. I don't say that I'm the most disciplined person in the world. Somebody asked George Whitfield, do you think that man's a Christian? said, I don't know, ask his wife. And if I'm a disciplined person, you'd have to ask my wife, somebody that lives with me. I know she's disciplined. But Paul said to the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men. If by any possible means, I might win them. And he said, I do this for the sake of the gospel. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Dr. Megg spoke, I'm told, this afternoon about the problems that face an evangelist or a clergyman. And I read the other day, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I read that more than 5,000 clergymen leave the ministry every year because of fouled up lives in their marriage. I don't know whether that's true or not. But I know this, that I heard an old evangelist years ago say that there are three things that trap an evangelist. One is pride and how subtle the devil is. Pride and how the devil can use that in our lives. People are, Many times in a question and answer period at a seminary or a school or a press conference, they say, how do you maintain your humility? I said, first of all, I don't have any. And I said, secondly, God says to humble yourself. That's one of our jobs, to keep ourselves humble before God and realize that our ministry is from God and it's his work. Salvation is of the Lord. I never say I led anybody to Christ, for example because too many factors went into that person coming to Christ. I was just one part of something that maybe led him to Christ. And it might be the least part. It might have been a mother's prayers over a period of years. It might be a holy man of God from the pulpit in the church. It might be a thousand other things. And then how many have been tripped up on money? I remember when we started uh, our evangelistic crusades, um, the evangelists live by love offerings, and uh, that's the only way some can do. They have to do it. I know that. But our love offerings had gotten mighty big in big crowds in 1950. And when we left Atlanta, Georgia, after six weeks in the Ponce de Leon ballpark, where we'd built a big tabernacle inside the ballpark, uh, they gave us a very huge offering, and Cliff Barris and I used to split it along with and give some to Bev Shea for singing and so forth. But uh, at least 40 to 50% of it was mine. And they had a picture in the paper the next day of a great big bag of money and a picture of me waving goodbye in a new convertible automobile. <laughs> I never felt so sick in my life. And I went to Dr. Jesse Bader, who was then the Secretary of Evangelism of the National Council of Churches, and that was before they got as far as they did, whichever way you're looking at it. And uh, I said, Dr. Bader, I said, um, this is a problem. I said, what should I do? He said, Billy, I've been praying for years that some evangelist will have the guts and the nerve to incorporate, pay themselves a salary comparable to the salary of a pastor. And he said, you're going to get a lot of criticism, but if you'll do it, you'll make history. So we sat down, and that's what we did. We formed a board of directors. They paid us a salary, which was published. I asked Dr. Bader what kind of salary we ought to have. He said, I think it would be fair if you got $15,000 a year, and that's exactly what we got, $15,000 a year and our expenses. 
Now, that doesn't sound like a great big salary today, but back then, that was pretty big. It wasn't as big as the pastor of the First Baptist Church of some place, but it was along there. And um, we didn't get all the side benefits quite. We picked them up as we went along, but uh, people would give us a suit of clothes. They'd give a new pair of shoes. And one, I had at least one automobile given me in those days. But uh, money becomes a big problem. And learn to budget your family budget and live within the budget. And don't put emphasis on money in the meetings. You know, in our television, we decided that we would never go beyond three minutes per hour on television mentioning a little book that we give away and mentioning our financial need. And I said, if I ever have to stoop to begging for money on television, I'm going to quit evangelism. Because the Lord knows the need, and I believe he can lay it upon the hearts of people to give. We're on television tonight. I'm preaching I don't know what tonight. <laughs> on, a, on about 300 stations. The reason I said that is because we won last night, and I couldn't get it because we're not on in Louisville. We're on in Indianapolis, and I saw in the paper four or five other places we're on around, but not in Louisville. At least I couldn't get it on the set in our motel. And uh, so I called my wife, and she said, your program has just gone off the air. And uh, she said, oh, it was wonderful music. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I said, well, uh, what did I preach on? I'd forgotten because it was back in the summer in Boise, uh, Idaho. And she said, uh, she fumbled around, and I could tell she hadn't listened to the sermon. <laughs> because she's working on a book and she's been staying up till about two o'clock in the morning on that book and I knew that's what she'd been working on. But she, she loved that music. But uh, I don't know what I'm preaching on tonight, but uh, on 300 stations we have the privilege of preaching. And I'm writing an article right now, which takes a lot of time, for TV Guide, which I have to have give to them Monday in New York, on tele-evangelism. And they want me to write on, on money and evangelism. They want me to write on what I see is the future of evangelism on television and how we got started and all the rest of it. And I've been working on that article, and so I have a lot of thoughts on it at the moment. And one of the things I've been praying for and hoping for is that those who are on television will realize that just one person misusing it can hurt the whole cause. Because we've got a lot of pressure. We've got a lot of pressure throughout the country uh, right now and in the Congress to pass laws and bills, for example, the flat tax, what, what in the world would that do to the giving to the churches and to an, uh, charitable institutions and to a program like ours and other things like that? There are so many bills now before the Congress that have to be watched all the time because there are people that are working to try to get it off television, get the gospel off television. And we have to pray that God will protect it. I love all those fellows that are on. I, I know some, most of them. I don't know them all. I know one fellow. I wish I did have an opportunity to talk to him. Because the other morning I watched him and he, he went from one end of the stage to the other. And he kicked at everything and knocked a bowl of flowers off in his enthusiasm. And then he took the rest of the time to raise money for something that had nothing to do with his television. Now that type of thing I'm not so sure is helpful. I'm not going to condemn him. Maybe God led him to do that, but he's not leading me to do that anyway. Amen. 